Right. Thanks very, very, very much, Jeff and John, for that, that introduction. And I will be giving um, a back, the background to um, Europe's lost frontiers. I think we we all know from the introduction that the the archaeology of the pre prehistoric coastal landscapes within the coastal shelves is becoming a strategic point of research for many areas from America through Northwest Europe, the Gulf, Southeast Asia, down to, to um, um, Australia. Um, these are critical areas at various periods for understanding the, the peopling of the earth and the archaeology of the regions. The area of the North Sea, Doggerland, isn't the largest of these areas, but as, as has al already been stressed, it is amongst the best studied of these areas, and that is of critical importance to today. However, we have to, in, 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 in set alongside the, um, the multitude of presentations we're going to hear from various parts of Britain and the world, this today is about Europe's lost frontiers. Um, this is the result of a single project, as Jeff has said, an ERC funded advanced grant. It's been, a, it's run over five years. It's brought together about 40 academics all the way from Cork to China to look at the landscapes of the Southern North Sea. And this has included archeologists, environmentalists, geneticists, software engineers, and modelers to look Vince. at the problem. Vince, sorry, you're not sharing yeah. slides. No yeah, slides. Oh. Yeah. That must be better. Yes? Yeah, that's I'm, it. Thanks, Vince. That. Okay, not a problem. Well, it is for you. Um, <laughs> anyways, we I had got on to the fact that we're looking at these the the um the collaboration over the past five years um to, to look at the Southern North Sea. Like all good projects, it has a backstory. Um, we know that there's been research related to the Southern North Sea for about you know, probably 200 years. There's only though been certain points and certain people who've probably progressed the, the research in this area in, in dramatic ways, which have allowed other people to do more research. You can go back to obviously the great work of Clement Reed back in 1913, his book on submerged forests. Um, um, Graham Clark, who was well, the doyen of um, Mesolithic archaeology in the UK, who was well aware of um, the potential of the Southern North Sea, if rather perplexed about what you could actually do to understand it, I would suggest. And of course, Bryony Clark, Bryony Coles rather, who, um, whose work in 1998 on um, Doggerland, a speculative survey, is the springboard for much of what you're going to, to, to hear over the next two days and probably inspired many of the people to do work in this area. Um, the last 20 years, though, has seen um, champions of, of research in, in on prehistoric inundated landscapes. Jeff, Nick, Nick Fleming, the networks they've created have been critical to how we've brought together a community to work in a much in a much larger, larger sense. It's probably worth remembering though what, what archaeology actually constituted 20 years ago. Um, if, if the whole area wasn't discounted as a land bridge to, between Britain and Europe, um, it was essentially a series of maps with almost no information in it, which would have any archaeological sense at any rate, um, reconstructions that relied on inherently irrelevant bathymetry, which generally didn't reflect the land surface as well we were looking at, and a whole series of artifacts which were generally trawled, chance finds of relatively little um, archaeological um, um, significance, although we're getting more and more out of this data, I should say. But even the iconic um, Le Mananoa point highlighted by um, Clark falls in, into this gap, and in fact, it's, its history has been revised in recent in recent years. Um, the 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 onset of Lost Frontiers, though, has to go back to. Um, the, to the North Sea Paleo landscapes, as Jeff has said, because much of what happened there has formed or guided the work that was done within Lost Frontiers. And it was largely a, a product of a series of chance encounters, actually starting with the, with the um, initiation of a PhD 
by Simon Fitch looking at the um, use of um, 3D seismic data from oil and gas to, um, to, to look at these, um, these blank maps that we had in the, in the North Sea. Um, that was facilitated by Ken Thompson, a basin geomorphologist who worked in the project and sadly died in 2007, um, who introduced us to the industry. PGS um, provided through their good offices initially 6,000 square kilometers of seismic data um, um, to see if we could actually find anything. I don't believe they were holding their breath at the time. However, the results were such that within a relatively short time, um, his English heritage through the aggregates levy, remember that, um, provided funding for um, about to look at about 24,000 square kilometers of seismic data on the basis of this earlier work. And that provided the mapping Doggerland book and the basis for all our, all our future work following that. Um, the, the, it is worth, however, remembering something about the problems and technical issues there. We were relatively well supported in, in IT terms, but actually, if you look at it, the core storage for analyzing 24,000 kilometers was five terabytes, which would clearly not support any of the, da the massive data sets we're looking at today. But this, to a certain extent, reflected the limitations of what we were doing. We were looking at relatively coarse data, it provided good overviews of specific types of features. We were also only looking at the half, top half second of the um, seismic columns. That's essentially the Mesolithic. Now we knew that there, was, uh, there were earlier landscapes beneath that, which we could see, but for commercial reasons, we weren't actually allowed to look at that at the time. Now that, wasn't uh, in the end a bad, necessarily a bad thing because we probably couldn't have used the exponential data, data that would have arrived if we'd attempted to do so. The other point was how we looked at the data. The information was very good at allowing us to volume render river channels, estuaries, lakes, features of that sort, which were important because we felt that was be where we would find the environmental sediments that would allow us to take major steps forward as we went through as we went forward. But it also meant we were only looking at particular parts of this landscape, even though we hadn't seen them before. Um, it also told us something else that was important. When we had these maps of, of landscapes, we presumed or features we presumed were early Holocene, they almost had no relationship to the existing sedimentary archive virtually none of the cores that existed within the area we were studying were of relevance to our own work directly. It was clear if we wanted plants, if we wanted animals, if we wanted ultimately people, we were going to have to do um, work which was directed for archaeological purposes. Um, we did expand the areas that we were looking at with the um, American funding from NOAA and help from um, the Dutch Geological Service. We expanded the area within the Southern North Sea into the Eastern sectors. With an Anglo-Welsh aggregate funding, we went off to the West Coast, to look at the Irish Sea um, and the Seven Estuary. Critically though, with the, the British Geological Survey, we were able to participate in the Humber Regional Environmental Characterization Project. That allowed us to ground truth some of the, the features we are seeing. You have to understand that a decade ago, or slightly more than a decade ago, many, some people at least didn't believe we were looking at early Holocene features. So being able to actually ground truth this was critical for the future development within the, the, within the North Sea. And the Humber Rec allow, allowed that. Certainly by 2013, we'd managed to get a, an outline map of about 45,000 square kilometers of Holocene, early Holocene landscape in the areas that were amenable to study. Not all were, the shallower areas, particularly to the south and the east, were not so well, so well conducive to mapping. That was an issue. Now, this slide is, I think, quite important. It is 11 years old. This was what we were thinking at around, in around 2010. Um, 
Ben Geary's most favorite quote, all models are wrong, some models are useful there. We realized that we weren't looking for post holes. We realized we wanted to explore and populate landscapes, but there were real problems. The scales at which we work, the resolutions at which we work, weren't actually conducive to looking at the archeological behavior as such. The temporal and distribution of mappable units was also a problem. We produced a lot of features. We had dates for virtually none of them, and that was a problem. Also, we had hints of the geological complexity of the data of the, that was within the data, but we couldn't resolve an awful lot of that. Put that together with the fact that we were actually looking at small areas of landscape because of the nature of the, of the 3D seismic surveys themselves. That meant we knew that we couldn't move forward to, to the level of archaeological consideration that we wanted to. We needed to work to, to, work, to, to do more complex work. Work. And that's when Europe's Lost Frontiers came in. Now, it took three years of planning to get this project. However, we had, we thought, a very simple and elegant plan. Um, we were going to do um, near total mapping of the early Holocene landscapes. We'd have a program of targeted coring down river valleys so we could look at the inundation process chronologically and get the sediment, sediments that we knew must be there to give us an insight into the environment of the landscapes we were looking at, to go beyond just a bare top topographic map. All of this, we hope, would run alongside a computer simulation, which would allow us to look at the dynamic environment and explore it in a, in a, in a three and four dimensional manner. Um, we got our study areas, much of which again actually correlated with the work we'd, areas we've been looking at the, within the North Sea Pali Landscape projects, with um, a nod towards the north, to what we thought at the time was northern Doggerland. This um, has, has changed, as you will see, in particularly in the, um, in the um, lecture by Simon Fitch follower, following this. Um, but of course, the moment you start a, pro a, a project, the first casualty is your plan, that lovely, elegant, simple plan that we had. And part of the problem was Brexit. We immediately had problems in licensing. We weren't allowed to do the numbers of calls that we expected, and we had to revise what we were doing. However, that allowed us to, to change some of, the, some of the plans that we'd had. And from moving from the two um, river valleys that we'd intended to look at um, on do the Dogger Bank and coming out of the um, uh, of the um, the wash, a large very large river valley valley going east west. We also moved towards a smaller valley, slightly to the south, which gave us a good access to the whole of the course of this particular valley down to an estuary, and that proved to be a very significant change, as you will see in the in the papers that follow follow this. We also went out into the off the west coast we weren't going to be stuck in just the north sea working with our irish colleagues it sligo the marine institute we had access to the celtic voyager to work in the cardigan bay in the irish sea the the weather for this was awful. Um, it meant that we couldn't collect data in the Irish Sea. And for a while, I thought we were going to lose James Bonsall as well. Um, he suffered terribly during that, that voyage. But we did collect work in Cardigan Bay, and this will be um, looked at um, by Rachel Harding in later, later today. We also critically began a collaborative work with our Belgian and Dutch colleagues. And this was important because it also gave us access to research vessels to allow an iterative process of development. We were particularly interested in the Brown Bank, an area where there's a concentration of, of uh, Mesolithic artifacts, which we thought we could link to surfaces which might be eroding out. It also allowed us to look at the southern, the southern river estuary in detail because we felt at least that there would be exposed surfaces there which might expose um, um, actually archeological artifacts that we could um, make, make perhaps even prospect for as will be reported again later. We produced essentially 
about 109 cores across all these areas. Uh, some of these are duplicates, some of them actually weren't very useful, but nonetheless, the important thing about this though, is this iterative process was only su uh, su uh, successful because we had access to research vessels provided through European partnerships. We had the ability to do this through UK means, would have, it would have been impossible. We have almost no access to the level of resource we require. And as we go forward, this is something that is going to have to change within the, U the UK. When it came to the, the, the results, well, as you will see today, um, we pr produced, um, group, I think, um, insights into methodologies for specific um, um, technologies and uh, areas of research. We've, we've produced specific case studies related to these. In some areas, we've been able to aggregate this, this data to produce significant significant outputs down to individual individual events. Um, the work we did on the Storega um, in particular um, demonstrates um, the, the, the capacity to bring this work this work together. Um, it's also of course shown some of the problems. The area is complex. It's much more complex than we've than we than we actually um, well we anticipated, but now we're starting to see it. This is a fractally complex area, and bringing this data together has been a problem. And sometimes it's contradictory, as you'll see. But that's part of the the challenges of working here. The other point, I'm afraid, has been COVID. We are a year behind where we expected to be. We had expected to come um, with monographs in hand. That is not the case. We'll be running to November. But now you will be able to see where we are, how the results of much of the work and the, the overall significance of what we're doing. And with that, and under the BDI of Jeff, I will now stop and hand over to the people who did the work. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vince, uh, for that introduction. There is actually one question that's popped up in the chat mm -hmm. box from uh, yeah. Bob Bewley. He refers to the Aggregates Levy Fund, which supported yeah. some of your earlier work. He says, as far as he knows, that fund still exists, but it now goes into the, the UK government treasury. And he wonders whether there's any chance of resurrecting that fund for your sort of research. I think the um, the aggregates levy saved most of British archaeology du du during the, the the beginning of the century. Um, if the if that were possible to, to free up some of this, it would be critical. It really spurred um, um, research in these areas, and we have to make the case to the British government. I don't think I can I can um, emphasise too much that this area around the whole of the UK is under-resourced. We can't keep relying on other people to keep our research going. 